Good evening. Well, welcome to this evening's lecture, this part of our uh, regular uh, ethics lecture series. And as you know, we usually begin with a, a prayer or a reflection, and I thought it would be appropriate to have a reflection from Aldo Leopold from his Sand County Almanac, which I consider one of the best books ever written. And, uh, and it's also nice because you can choose seasonal passages. So this is from the uh, section in November. Out of the clouds I hear a faint bark, as of a faraway dog. It is strange how the world cocks its ears at that sound, wondering. Soon as it is louder, the honk of geese, invisible but coming on. The flock emerges from the low clouds, a tattered banner of birds, dipping and rising, blown up and blown down, blown together and blown apart, but advancing, the wind wrestling lovingly with each winnowing wing. When the flock is a blur in the far sky, I hear the last honk, sounding taps for summer. It is warm behind the driftwood now, for the wind has gone with the geese. So would I if I were the wind. Well, we're delighted to have you here this evening for this presentation. And we're going to uh, start off with an announcement from Kirsten Gabriel, who's our academic programs coordinator. She has an announcement about a scholarship opportunity. So Kirsten. Thank you, Rick. Um, well, hello, everyone. I just wanted to take one moment of your time. Um, given the content of tonight's presentation, I just have a scholarship that I thought some of uh, the participants here tonight might be interested in. Um, every year, the Udall Foundation awards approximately eight or scholarships to juniors and seniors who are interested in pursuing careers related to the environment or to Native American tribal policy or Native American health care. Uh, the scholarship itself is about $5,000 towards educational expenses and can be renewed um, for multiple years, and uh, given that there's 80 of them every year, um, we certainly thought that some of uh, the Viterbo students might be interested and certainly well qualified for this scholarship. So what I will do is I have uh, a flyer about the scholarship that will be available at each of the doors. So as you exit tonight, if you are a sophomore or junior and are pursuing a career or interested in pursuing a career eventually here um, related to the environment, tribal policy, or um, tribal health care. By all means, pick one of these up. There's some good information on it, um, and there's some information about how you can contact uh, some of the folks on campus who are devoted to scholarships and fellowships um, to kind of get some information and some support. So enjoy the rest of your night. Thanks for giving me a few minutes, and uh, enjoy your lecture. Thank you, Kirsten. And uh, tonight's speaker is made possible because of a, uh, a conversation that I had last year with Sam Shinta, who is a publisher for Fulcrum Publishing. Uh, Fulcrum Publishing is, a, is, a, is based in Denver, and uh, um, you might want to look on the website uh, uh, just to see the wide range of things that they publish, a really interesting uh, uh, selection of books. Uh, but uh, Sam lives in Alaska and runs a business out of it, a home office there in Alaska, and um, is routinely meeting these really interesting people that uh, that they're publishing uh, books by. And, and so we talked about the idea of having a, a collaboration where occasionally uh, uh, an author that they've just recently published would come here and be part of our lecture series. And so that's how this came about tonight. And I asked Sam if he would introduce our speaker. So please welcome Sam Shinta. Good evening. My name is Sam Shinta. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, I would like to thank Viterbo University, Rick Kite, and the D.B. Reinhardt Institute for Ethics and Leadership for hosting the event this evening. Uh, before we get started, I also wanted to acknowledge we've got a special guest in the audience this evening, uh, Ms. Ada Deer. Ada, if you could raise your hand or stand up. As many of you know, Ada is one of the great Native American leaders of the past 50 years in this country, and so let's welcome her this evening. So happy you could join us. In almost two decades of book publishing, I've had the honor and pleasure of working with some of the most significant Native American thinkers of our time, including the late Vine Deloria Jr., the late Wilma Mankiller, John Trudell, and Norbert Hill. Through their important works, they have explored the current state of Indian country, emphasizing that Native Americans are not only a living, breathing culture, but more significantly, a very important part of the American fabric today. 
More significantly, through their writings, these authors transcend the label of solely native authors and are, in fact, great American thinkers. Any such list would, by necessity, have to include our speaker for this evening, Walter Echohawk. Walter Echohawk is a lawyer, tribal judge, scholar, and activist whose legal experience has included Native American religious freedom, prisoner rights, water rights, treaty rights, and reburial and repatriation rights. He has worked as a lawyer for the Native American Rights Fund for more than 35 years. He is admitted to practice law before the United States Supreme Court and is an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court and a member of the Pawnee Nation. In 1989, Walter negotiated a national reburial agreement with the Smithsonian Institution, which was enacted into law. In the early 1990s, he helped lead a national campaign for passage of the Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act, an important human rights law. In 1994, Walter represented the Native American Church of North America to secure passage of the American Indian Religious Freedom Act Amendments of 1994 to protect religious use of peyote by Indians. Presently, he represents the Klamath tribes of Oregon to quantify treaty-protected water rights in Southern Oregon in a highly publicized and controversial set of federal and state litigation. A prolific writer, his publications include an award-winning book, Battlefields and Burial Grounds. This year, Fulcrum proudly released, In the Courts of the Conqueror, the 10 Worst Indian Law Cases Ever Decided. This book is a fresh and provocative account of the dark underbelly of the American legal system and its complicity in undermining the rights of Native Americans. I personally would put this book right up there with such classics as God is Red and Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee as seminal works on Native American culture and history over the last period of time. But don't just take my word for it. According to the great religious thinker Houston Smith, for those who are concerned with justice, this book is absolute dynamite. Thank God for Walter Echohawk, watchdog extraordinaire who blows the whistle loudly when the rules of fair play are violated. And according to author and activist Phil Cousineau, the book, quote, should be required reading for all Americans who care about the inherent human rights of religious and political freedom. Walter has received various awards, such as the American Bar Association Spirit of Excellence Award for legal work in the face of adversity, and the Civil Liberties Award from the ACLU of Oregon for significant contributions in the cause of individual freedom. He was recently awarded the Sarah T. Hughes Civil Rights Award, as well as the Oklahoma State Distinguished Native American Alumni Award. Since 1995, Walter has served as a member of the Carter Center's International Human Rights Council. Walter serves as chairman of the board for the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation, a new foundation dedicated to tribal philanthropy to preserve Indian art and culture. Tonight, Walter will discuss with us a new land ethic for our nation, one that includes the importance of incorporating indigenous values and wisdom in developing a truly American land ethic for the 21st century. Please join me in welcoming Walter Echohawk. Good evening, everyone, and also Ada Deer. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I'd like to um, thank uh, Dr. Kite and uh, the university for um, <clears throat> bringing me here tonight to this beautiful, beautiful country here in uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin. Uh, I think that uh, we're very uh, honored to, uh, I'm very honored to be here in this uh, beautiful river valley and uh, I'd like to uh, pay my respects to the Ho-Chunk people as being a guest in your beautiful homeland. Um, and um, <clears throat> I'm very uh, pleased and uh, uh, privileged to be a part of this lecture series, uh, to lecture uh, on ethics. And I appreciate that very kind introduction, uh, Sam Shinta, uh, uh, for, uh, from uh, Fulcrum Press. Um, I happen to, uh, to be in the area 
uh, to uh, on as a part of the lecture tour, book lecture tour on this in the courts of the conqueror, um, and um, I think we'll be signing some some books, uh, impromptu uh, books, at the conclusion of this lecture uh, this evening. But I think La Crosse is very fortunate to have Sam Shinta and his family uh, living here in the community. Um, uh, he, he really has been instrumental, uh, it seems to me, in bringing uh, Native American literature to the forefront of the American public and uh, uh, bringing uh, our views of our contemporary writers, you know, into uh, the American discourse. Uh, some of our great and profound thinker, thinkers, you know, such as Vine, the late Vine Deloria, you know, who was a uh, theologian and attorney, um, uh, profound thinker, I think, for, for any uh, race of people and uh, place and age. And so uh, I'm very privileged to uh, work with Sam, and, and uh, I, I think we're fortunate to have him here in this community. <clears throat> My topic tonight is Toward an American Land Ethic. In my view, no discussion about ethics can be complete without considering how we, as human beings, should comport ourselves to the land and to the animals and plants which grow upon the land. And I think that that's a problematic uh, uh, issue for, especially for a modern industrialized uh, uh, nation that's living in, an, in a technological age, uh, a nation uh, in the modern world that is becoming increasingly alienated from the natural world. <clears throat> and uh, so before I begin, I'd just like to pose a question to you, and that is this. How does America view the land in the 21st century? I, I don't think that we have a clear uh, land ethic or, or a clear uh, cohesive land ethic for our society. And in fact, I think if we were to go around the room here and ask uh, each of, of us, you know, how do, how do we view the land? We might get uh, as many different answers as we have uh, people in the room here. Um, and I think in part, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex question for our society because I just simply don't think that uh, the non-Indian uh, people have been here that long, that our society just simply hasn't been on the land long enough to have a cohesive and clear uh, land ethic. Um, and it may also be a part of our problem is that our society is very diverse. There might be, there would, could be many uh, voices and, and attitudes towards the land among our pluralistic uh, society. How would the urban blacks, for example, view the land? How do the uh, uh, Chicano population view the land? How do Native Americans view the land? How do uh, farmers and ranchers uh, view the land. I think we would have a, a variety of, uh, uh, of uh, viewpoints about our relationship to the animals and plants and how, how we comport ourselves to them, um, depending on what sector of society we have. Um, but as far as these questions, what do they have to do with ethics? Uh, to me, and I'm not a philosopher, I don't have a philosophy degree, but uh, it seems to me that ethics uh, are what gives us a moral compass and a sense of right and wrong. And I think that for that reason, ethics are vital to every human being. They're vital to every society and to every civilization, this moral compass. And I think that uh, ethics in that same regard is integral to every worldview or every cosmology. Um, and why is that? Because ethics tell us how to comport ourselves as human beings. And in that regard, ethics fundamentally shape us as a people. And I think that, if I can speculate 
simply as an attorney, and you probably don't want to hear about ethics from an attorney. You're probably wondering why an attorney uh, would, would speak to ethics, but I think that there's many sources of ethics. We can look to guidance from religion as to what is right and wrong. We can look to philosophy as a source of ethics. We can look to plain old common sense as well. We can also uh, look to the law for guidance as to what right and wrong might be. And I think that any sense of ethics or right or wrong uh, uh, behavior for human beings also is uh, moored by your particular culture as well and shaped by your culture. So uh, we could ponder then, you know, uh, as far as ethics and a moral compass, uh, do, do ethics uh, set forth a universal uh, set of normative behavior or are ethics uh, uh, rather uh, culturally distinct? Do ethics change over time or are there just uh, universal and enduring notions of right and wrong? Are ethics situational or do they express immutable uh, values of, of proper human uh, behavior? I can't answer these questions, you know, because I don't have a philosophy degree. But um, um, it just seems to me, however, that uh, all of these questions of ethics um, uh, do come down and are relevant uh, in the question that I posed earlier, and that is, how should we as human beings comport ourselves to the land and to the animals and plants that grow on the land? I think that that question raises a set of ethical questions about right behavior and wrong behavior that will fundamentally or should fundamentally shape us as a nation. And what I'd like to do this evening is touch on five areas, if I may. Uh, first of all, I'd like to talk about the need for a land ethic. Secondly, I'd like to uh, uh, talk about the role or the potential role of Native America in helping to develop a land ethic. Third, I'd like to look at some various models from our human family, uh, models for uh, looking at the land. Our diverse human family has uh, already developed a number of various models for a land ethic that we could look at and perhaps synthesize the, the best in these existing models. Fourth, I'd like to explore some of the powerful forces that have stymied the development of a land ethic here in the United States. I think it's important to uh, understand these forces that have precluded our nation uh, down to the present day in developing a very clear and uh, strong uh, land ethic foundation for human behavior. And then finally, I'd like to just end on some, some uh, c concluding thoughts about the development of a land ethic here in the United States. I, and I hope we have a, a time for a few questions afterwards. And, and uh, if we do proceed with this book, uh, book signing, uh, I'm going to be available for more uh, questions as we go along as well, and in case you have questions that we don't get to at the end of the uh, general lecture here. But let me, let me turn to the first point that I wanted to address tonight. That is the need for a land ethic in the United States. I think we could all agree that a land ethic has been hard to achieve here in the United States. More than 60 years ago, uh, in the year 1948, Aldo Leopold lamented, lamented the lack of a land ethic. Leopold was, uh, is considered the father of a natural uh, wildlife management here in the United States, a very uh, prominent uh, 
uh, environmentalists. <clears throat> and um, he's sort of the father uh, as an influential ecologist and uh, forester, uh, the father of our, uh, uh, considered to be the father of our public uh, wildlife management here in the, in, the, in the United States. But he lamented, and I'll quote uh, from him, there is as yet no ethic dealing with man's relation to land and to the animals and plants which grow upon it. And in that uh, uh, year, 1948, he uh, tried to plant the seeds for a land ethic. And in, in doing so, uh, Leopold urged us to decolonize the way that we look at the land and to try to evolve a land ethic as a social project, a product of a mature society. And he hoped back then, over 60 years ago, that such an ethic would fundamentally change um, our role as Americans from conquerors of the land and the animals and plants that grow upon it to becoming more of uh, members of a uh, biotic land community that coexists on the, on the same land with these other forms of life. And he wrote, and I'm gonna quote from him, in human history, we have learned, I hope, that the conqueror's role is eventually self-defeating. Why? Because it is implicit in such a role that the conqueror knows ex cathedra just what makes the land tick and just what and who is valuable and who, what and who is worthless. It always turns out that he knows neither and this is why his conquests eventually defeat themselves. But I think it's unfortunate that um, Leopold's land ethic did not really take root in the 20th century. To be sure, I, I believe uh, progress was made towards the end of the 20th century with the passage of the Endangered Species Act and our, our, our public land laws. Uh, in, you know, wilderness protection, water quality, and, and, and uh, these uh, uh, environmental laws or environmental legislation, uh, I think, reflect changing social values about how we comport ourselves to the land at the end of the century. But old habits die hard, and I think that there's uh, several reasons why a, a la his land ethic has not yet taken root. At the beginning of the 20th century, uh, we were looking at the zenith of, uh, of um, colonialism or the age of imperialism. And our nation, by the beginning of the 20th century, had had a long uh, history here in the United States as a conqueror and a colonizer. Uh, beginning with the Revolutionary War, uh, uh, we, we saw a 100-year period uh, actually beginning in the 1790s to the 1890s, a 100-year war with the different Indian tribes, virtually ongoing for a 100-year period. Very aggressive uh, colonization of, of Indian uh, lands throughout the United States as manifest destiny had swept the nation in a few short dec decades, brushing aside the uh, the Indian tribes and their, their, land, their lands. And so uh, it, I think it's very true that coming into the 20th century, our nation had this heritage uh, as a conqueror and as a colonizer and very much in the year 1900 looked upon the land you know, through the eyes of a conqueror and a colonizer. Um, and, and that, that century began, you know, as I mentioned earlier, at the zenith of the age of imperialism with uh, the United States uh, ruling uh, far-flung empires, colonies all over the world, you know, the Philippines and Puerto Rico and Guam and uh, uh, all over the world. Um, and at home, uh, the Supreme Court in the year 1903 handed down the Lone Wolf Decision, which uh, treated the uh, 
the Indian reservations here at home as colonies as well. In, in the Lone Wolf decision, the Supreme Court uh, uh, announced this plenary power doctrine. That is that Congress has absolute power over Indians and their persons and their property. Plenary power, not subject to any judicial review. Um, and this, uh, this uh, absolute power of Congress over Indians uh, arose not from the Constitution, but from this guardianship principle, which was a, a, a principle of colonialism. And so the nation was ruling the Indian tribes here at home uh, the same way it was ruling its other con uh, 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 colonies abroad through the plenary power of Congress. Um, even after Leopold uh, uh, called for a land ethic in 1948, uh, it, it really never took root. You know, even as late as uh, 1955, in the Tihatun case, Tihatun versus United States, where the uh, U.S. Supreme Court, same Supreme Court that desegregated America in 1955. Uh, a few months later decided this Tiatun case, you know, which, which uh, sanctioned the confiscation of Aboriginal land in, in uh, Alaska uh, by Congress and the court saying, we don't have to compensate the Indians for taking their property. Um, but uh, he, that, that uh, doctrine of confiscation was, was uh, rationalized by the court uh, under the power of uh, con doctrine of conquest and the doctrine of discovery that John Marshall had articulated in 1823. So the Supreme Court in that case saying that the uh, every American schoolboy knows that the savage tribes of uh, Indian tribes were uh, uh, conquered peoples, you know, and, and, that, and that sort of uh, language. So that the Supreme Court by 1955 was still looking at, uh, at the land, you know, through the eyes of a, a conqueror. Even the foresters who followed in the footsteps of Leopold sort of lost the thread as well in their public stewardship of our, uh, uh, stewardship of our public lands. The U.S. Forest Service uh, 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 from time to time uh, having their professional uh, uh, forestry uh, principles being over, overrun by uh, pork barrel politics. I think that that agency uh, uh, becomes hostage to the uh, forestry uh, and other exploitive industry groups from time to time and allows pork barrel politics to um, overturn uh, or undermine our, our principles of uh, stewardship in the management of our uh, federal lands, at least uh, in the Forest Service. Um, so that by the, by the end of the 20th century, um, even as late as the year uh, 2008, we had uh, we saw uh, Sarah Palin, governor of Alaska, uh, fervently uh, ch chanting the mantra of uh, of uh, the conqueror, or looking at the land through the eyes of a conqueror, drill, baby, drill, and then we're gonna mine, baby, mine. Um, <clears throat> so I think that these old habits. Uh, die hard as far as uh, trying to achieve a land ethic. And uh, even as uh, recently as uh, this summer, you know, we, we experienced this uh, uh, BP uh, uh, oil well catastrophe in the Gulf of Mexico. And I, I was looking at the newspaper there and, and into the Gulf of Mexico, and it's just dotted with these oil wells as if, as if the uh, ocean were uh, and the Gulf of Mexico were one vast uh, American um, uh, oil field, you know, and I just don't know how we, uh, if that's the way that we've decided then to comport our to the ocean as human beings. But uh, in any event, uh, there's uh, the land ethic that uh, Leopold uh, called for in 1948 just simply didn't take root in the 20th century. And I, I think that we 
would be unable to articulate a, a clear land ethic today. I, uh, this summer I had a, uh, made a presentation at the uh, USDA office's headquarters there before the Secretary of Agriculture and his undersecretaries. And, and uh, um, I, I just, it was my sense there that, that if we went around that conference table there that, that they would have been unable to articulate a clear and a cohesive land ethic um, but I think we need a land ethic. There is a need for a land ethic. I think that our stewards must have a clear set of values and a very clear outlook that guides the way that we look at the land as a society. And the reason being is that the land is ever so important to us. It shapes human society be it our subsistence, our uh, architect, uh, the, uh, er everything in our society is shaped by the land that we live on. The land nurtures the human spirit. It seems to me that religion itself springs from the land. It's the land that gives us our identity as a people and as a culture. And I think it is also true that the, it's the land that makes us fully human uh, because this is where and how we interact with other forms of life, uh, the animals and plants, and it's through that process that we became fully human. It's the land that tells us our stories, that speaks to those that listen to the land uh, as far as our origins, our histories, our struggles as a people, our values and our beliefs, the sacred stories of the animals and the, and the uh, birds and the plant, it all comes from the land itself. It deeply shapes our human society and I think it lies at the center of every civilization. Uh, and one of the overarching influences on human society and I think that the way that we look at the land uh, really does reveal the innermost character of every society, whether that be a primal society of hunting, hunter fishers and gatherers, a society of farmers that uh, make their living fr uh, from uh, domesticated animals and plants, um, whether we look at the land uh, as conquerors, um, whether we look at the land of col as colonists. Uh, the way that a society looks at the land uh, tells us much you know, about its innermost values, it seems to me. Um, <clears throat> I, I would submit that a land ethic in the 21st century is sorely needed by our civilization here. Without a land ethic, I think it's self-evident or self-apparent or should be self-apparent that without a very clear and strong land ethic as a foundation, we can't summon, cannot summon the political will or the economic will to address the environmental problems that threaten our civilization uh, and our existence as a species. Secondly, um, a land ethic uh, helps every civilization uh, be a sustainable civilization, as every civilization must be in order to survive over time. Otherwise, we would uh, civilizations will suffer the fate of, uh, of uh, overtaxation, you know, and extinction. And I think for our own land, a land ethic is also an, a necessary ingredient for social change, for social change, so that we can evolve uh, from our rapacious uh, history of manifest destiny into a more um, uh, just culture or more just society that has come to terms uh, with the land and adapted uh, to the land more closely as the native people have done. So, uh, and, and perhaps even uh, uh, adopt some of the indigenous values as, in, in, as a part of this land ethic into our social fabric. And I think that's a part of 
a maturing society, uh, especially in a former colony or a settler state into a non-settler state. And I think uh, that, that time has, has come for our society uh, here in the U.S. to, to make that social evolution, that, that step to say we are no longer going to look at the land as a settler, uh, but we're going to adapt to it. And uh, the, the year 2007, uh, the United Nations, you know, passed this UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and it uh, sets forth a minimum standards for every nation, you know, for the survival and dignity and well-being of, of indigenous peoples. And I think uh, 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 it, it really calls for every nation to sort of decolonize the way they look at indigenous peoples and their indigenous habitats. So um, that is, uh, I think, a, 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 an evolutionary process now that the world is undergoing after 500 years of colonialism to uh, decolonize the world in a post-colonial world and uh, restore some of the uh, uh, rights of indigenous peoples, you know. And so um, I think for all of these reasons, you know, that we, we need a land ethics program to help develop some kind of a program to help our society develop a land ethic. Um, and uh, that, I would submit, is one of our paramount uh, uh, goals as a nation in the 21st century to uh, forge a, a land ethic and to maybe perhaps synthesize the very best in our different traditions to come up with a land ethic that is truly an American land ethic that fits the American condition and, and our soil and our habitat and our animals and plants. Thinking about uh, a, um, a, uh, a land ethic, um, um, I would submit to you that uh, Native America uh, would have, would, should have a seat at that table because um, uh, we have a lot to offer as indigenous peoples as far as uh, how to comport ourselves to um, uh, this um, Mother Earth or this corner of Mother Earth. And, you know, I've, I've had, I've uh, enjoyed a, a very a unique legal career working with the Native American Rights Fund uh, for 35 years. Uh, much of that uh, time I had the uh, privilege of uh, a sort of touring our Indian tribes in Native America here and uh, providing legal representation to uh, uh, the last generation of the past generation or, or so of uh, some of our very profound uh, tribal, traditional tribal religious leaders and uh, providing uh, a legal representation to them on protecting Native American uh, traditional religious freedom. I've also had the uh, privilege of uh, representing um, some of our hunting, fishing, and gathering cultures here in Native America as well in the Pacific Northwest and to protect indigenous habitat and water for habitat and uh, water for salmon, you know. And, and o over the years, I've, uh, uh, even though I'm uh, just a, was, I'm not a religious leader myself or uh, simply an, a, an attorney, a native rights attorney. Uh, I've really enjoyed uh, my privilege and learned a lot from seeing the, uh, uh, working closely with these religious leaders in the legal and legislative setting, you know, and I, uh, the area of prisons, you know, I uh, worked with the late Wallace Black Elk and uh, Archie, uh, Archie Lame Deer Fire, in the prisons, you know, to uh, uh, help bring in native religion into the prisons and enjoyed uh, many, many conversations with these very profound medicine men um, and uh, enjoying their sense of humor and their humanity and their uh, very uh, compelling uh, philosophy and, and their uh, spirituality. Um, areas of uh, protecting uh, holy places, Indian sacred sites, you know, uh, working with uh, people like the late Patrick Left Hand of the uh, Medicine Man 
religious leader of the Kootenai Indians uh, in Montana to looking at the, uh, the spiritual side of uh, some of these holy, holy places, you know, where the invested and endowed with, uh, with, uh, with uh, spirits of very profound importance in the, in the Kootenai religion. Um, and the repatriation work, uh, having the opportunity to uh, work on behalf of our dead ancestors, uh, literally sometimes with one foot in the spirit world and the, our tribal uh, traditional uh, leaders that take care of the dead and our f Indian funerals, you know, and uh, concern with the uh, well-being of the dead, you know. Uh, um, all of these different settings, including uh, working with the, the uh, late uh, uh, Douglas Long here, here of the Ho-Chunk people on uh, protecting the peyote uh, religion, you know, and uh, the late Reuben Snake, both of these are uh, very profound Ho-Chunk tribal leaders, you know, that uh, uh, worked very hard to uh, preserve that uh, special relationship between humans and this uh, plant of power, this peyote religion, which is the probably the uh, oldest, most continuously practiced religion in the hemisphere down to the present day. Um, um, and to, to um, uh, also uh, kind of, uh, I, I've spent uh, uh, many years also uh, with our hunter, fishers, and gatherers. Um, representing the Muckleshoot uh, salmon fishermen the Klamath hunter, fishers, and gatherers, you know, to uh, protect the uh, uh, habitat for a treaty hunting, fishing, and gathering in southern o Oregon. And um, also, even as recently as yesterday, I had a, um, a hearing uh, in Washington, D.C., a day-long uh, trial for the Clinket Indians of southeast Alaska who live in America's largest rainforest, the Tungus National Rainforest, which is about the size of uh, West Virginia. Um, 18 federally recognized tribes uh, live within that uh, uh, national forest and have lived there for 10,000 years, you know, in an awesome habitat, tribal habitat, where they evolved uh, a very profound cosmology and, and a, a culture, you know, a living among whales and uh, marine mammals of all descriptions, uh, mountains and glaciers and uh, bountiful uh, river streams uh, uh, with uh, berries and edible, uh, edible plants. Uh, uh, and I think over, over that lengthy uh, time span, you know, evolved a very, uh, uh, unique culture and, and uh, uh, that, that really uh, you can see it in their very eerie art, you know, that, that hardly any line exists between humans and, and, the, and, the, and the animals of this awesome habitat out, out, out there. But I had the occasion to represent them in Washington, D.C. to return uh, um, some sacred objects, you know, under the NAGPRA repatriation statute to work with uh, about 15 of their uh, very powerful traditional people uh, that, that were witnesses in this hearing yesterday in Washington. And I think that uh, in, in working with these people, um, traditional native people, that they have a lot to say about the land and how to comport ourselves. And in fact, these tribes that maintain their traditional ways of life and uh, also, uh, much of their hunting, fishing, and gathering uh, uh, cosmology for those tribes that uh, still live in their aboriginal areas and uh, uh, have values, I think, that, uh, and ideals and values that are, are seen in their behavior, their songs, their ceremonies, their language, their teachings, about how we as human beings should comport ourselves with, with the land and the ocean and the waters and the animals and plants, you know, that comprise uh, our tribal, hab the tribal habitats. And, and um, uh, we, I, I think that our nation is blessed um, uh, because, of, uh, you know, we, we don't have very many hunting, fishing, and gathering cultures left in the world today. 
but I think the United States has perhaps among the largest concentration of the surviving uh, hunting, fishing, and gathering cultures around different parts of the country, and particularly the Pacific Northwest, with which I've had most of my experience. But uh, it just seems to me that uh, in any discussion about an American land ethic, uh, we can gain much from looking at our tribal cultures that we have here and hopefully to uh, inc incorporate some of these indigenous values and, and uh, uh, fr from a uh, very uh, primal sets of uh, cosmologies that we have here in the United States and maybe synthesize that into uh, the best of some of our other traditions that we might have to forge a meaningful and truly unique American way of looking at the land that, uh, that, that banks hard and derives from some of the tribal cosmologies that have sprung from the soil uh, long ago. But, um, so I think that uh, native peoples uh, should have a good solid seat at the table when we get around someday to forge, forging a land ethic for our nation. I'd like to talk just a little bit. Um, I think there are four forces, four very powerful forces that stymie the development of a land ethic in the United States. These forces are extremely powerful ones, and I, think, I don't think that they're uh, going to be news to anyone, but it's sort of useful to list them all in one place. Uh, but I, I, I truly believe that most Americans living in our modern, industrialized, uh, 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 technological, uh, secular uh, society are, that we really have become alienated from the land and, and the natural world, um, especially by these four forces that I'd like to talk about. And I think that we need to understand these forces that are at play here. And they have to be confronted and discarded, it seems to me, before we can develop an American land ethic. <clears throat> The first uh, problem that I think bars the formation of a land ethic is a cosmological problem. It's a problem of cosmology or conflict between two very venerated cosmologies of the human race. On the one hand, we have a, um, uh, our oldest cosmology as a species is the hunting, fishing, and gathering cosmology or a way of a cosmology is a way of looking at the world understanding the world around us the way things are um, is a cosmology our species has two two very uh, overarching cosmologies and the oldest one is this hunting fishing and gathering cosmology we've had it for hundred and fifty million years Going back that far, the entire human race was composed of hunters, fishers, and gatherers. As hu mankind or hu humanity spread across the planet, uh, they were living in the natural world as hunters, fishers, and gatherers, and had to comport themselves with the awesome animals and the plants in order to spread across the planet to survive as any good hunters, fishers, and gatherers. These instincts are uh, the knowledge of uh, as hunters, fishers, and gatherers and how to comport themselves, how to sanctify their presence in the natural world are wired into our biology, uh, fundamentally shaping our, our psyche and the, the brain and mind and ears and eyes of every individual in, in this room, whether you know it or not, you uh, rose as uh, hunters, fishers, and gatherers. And, and I think that still lies within all of us, although it might beat uh, dimly in this uh, modern age. 
But I think that uh, to, to, for the hunter, fishers, and gatherers that live and flourish in the natural world, placing animals and plants on a spiritual plane to interact with them and to forge these uh, relationships uh, with, with the plant world and, and, and the animals and, and to uh, understand that we have important relatives in the animal world and the plant world and that human beings, you know, we have to cooperate with these processes uh, in order to survive and flourish. This is an ancient uh, uh, way of life for the, for the human family for 150,000 years. And uh, today we only have surviving pockets of that cosmology that teaches us how to live and to view the world and the, the land and the animals and plants, pr primarily among the indigenous uh, peoples that are still uh, pockets that are living in their aboriginal habitat or their indigenous habitats, some places in Africa, North America, South America, Australia, other uh, tribal areas, you know, New Guinea. Uh, the, these uh, uh, surviving hunting, fishing, and gathering cosmologies uh, um, are perfectly viable ways of looking at the world. And uh, they're the primal ones. And prim by primal, I mean they, they came first. They came first in our human family. Um, 10,000 years ago, a competing cosmology arose uh, in, in uh, the Middle East as uh, the human family began to uh, domesticate these animals and to domesticate these plants. And this is the agrarian or agricultural cosmology or way of looking at the land. Uh, that This cosmology has also has sanctified you know, the domestication and the strict control of animals and their, uh, their uh, animal biology and genetics and strictly controlling plants and uh, uh, the uh, re reordering the uh, natural world, the hydrology to irrigate crops and to uh, uh, eradicate wild animals and uh, insects and wild plant native plants, you know, as pests, you know, to because the genius of our agriculture is to control uh, nature to make it more productive for man, to control, strictly control the behavior of uh, and reproduction, you know, of, of domesticated animals and plants. And, and for 10,000 years ago, uh, as that branch of our human family uh, uh, came through the Middle East, um, that exalts, that, that cosmology exalts uh, humans over all, all uh, life on, on the planet. And it's seen in Genesis, you know, that uh, where, where uh, in the origin, sacred origin story, you know, of the agrarian societies, you know, God, gave all of the animals, you know, to the, uh, to the human beings, you know, and, and placed them under their uh, control, saying that the animals and plants will be in fear of humans, you know, and it's sort of a very different way uh, of uh, comporting yourselves to animals and plants. And in the uh, Western uh, uh, intellectuals and Western science, you know, further um, alienates humans from animals they have no spirit of their own, which is a radical departure from the hunters and fishers uh, outlook, you know, but animals are simply robots that function with, uh, with that on instinct and they, they have no souls, they have no spirit, you know, and that, that's a vastly different way of uh, looking at, uh, looking at our other forms of life from that of the hunter, fisher, and gather cosmology. And, I think that over time, the, uh, this agrarian uh, cosmology, which is fairly aggressive, an aggressive cosmology, has overtaken the hunter, fisher, and gather cosmology and relegated it to uh, isolated pockets. And uh, so that most people now in the modern world uh, dismiss the hunting, fishing, and gathering cosmology as primitive, as inferior, something to be disparaged um, and perhaps stamped out even 
uh, but both of these are uh, uh, venerated uh, and perfectly viable ways of understanding the world and how we should comport ourselves as human beings. Um, and I think this conflicting cosmology, the, the problem that has emerged is that the agrarian or agricultural cosmology uh, has uh, over, overtaken or predominated and has suppressed the hunting, fishing, and gathering cosmology. And the task is to bring about a better balance between these cosmologies uh, so that uh, they, they can learn to um, uh, respect and, and be, uh, you know, uh, together on one, in one land, I guess. So I think that that's a problem, you know, this uh, um, conflicting cosmologies and, and uh, being out of balance as far as the venerated ways that our human family has traditionally looked at the world around us. <clears throat> um, so that, that we could try to bring out the, the best in both of these cosmologies in terms of forging a land ethic. The second problem, it seems to me, is a religious question. A religious question that has also uh, uh, hindered the development of a land ethic, and that is our own history, the United States history of religion, and especially our uh, uh, history of religious discrimination and religious intolerance against our indigenous religions here in the United States. I think that we can, as uh, Christians, you know, we can, we can look at the roots of uh, Genesis and, and the Christian tradition and see that it imparts no uh, spiritual side to our, our country here or our animals and plants. Any holy ground is located in the Middle East. And, um, and so uh, we can't easily find in those doctrines uh, a land ethic for this corner of Mother Earth. And at the same time, we have this long history of religious discrimination in our country, in, in the history of American religion, where the religions of the indigenous peoples were uh, there, was a, there was this attempt to stamp it out, to suppress it and stamp it out through the machinery of government. And, uh, that, uh, and the use of the law, such as the, uh, in, the Code of Indian Offenses that was promulgated by the Secretary of Interior in 1890. Um, and and uh, it banned the practice of traditional religion which was in full force in effect until 1934, uh, where the Establishment Clause of the U.S. Constitution was violated in Indian policy. You know, the Establishment Clause says separation of church and state, and the state shall not foster or promote one religion over another, was completely violated in federal Indian policy in the 19th century placing missionaries in charge of uh, Indian nations as, as their Indian agent to convey Indian land to church groups to go out and proselytize the children, uh, to, to uh, uh, take the Indian youth, you know, separate them from their families and to brainwash them in the Indian uh, boarding schools, you know, to inoculate, uh, stamp out their religions and and instill another, implant another religion in the children. And then, uh, then the violation of the free exercise clause as well, you know, through the code of Indian offenses, the use of the military at, at uh, wounded knee to stamp out the ghost dance. Um, a very uh, uh, dark side of our uh, religion history here in the United States. And then all that with the rise of secularism in our society over, over in, in the modern era as well, where the secular has sort of pushed the sacred to, relegated the sacred to the margin 
in American life, you know, in general. And uh, we see that in the Supreme Court decision in the Smith case of 1990, the peyote decision, which uh, really narrowed the uh, uh, reach of the First Amendment and said, if you need to get, uh, if you have a minority religion, the courts can no longer accommodate it. You got to go to Congress to have Congress the, in the political arena, secular political arena, to accommodate your religious practice. That was the, the law firmly placing the sacred under secular control there. And the, these two factors, the history of religious discrimination and the rise of secularism, uh, added up to uh, uh, hinder the development of a land ethic. Because what that does, it, it blinds us as a society from seeing the spiritual side of Mother Earth. And, and we just cannot see the holy ground that we under our, our very feet here at home. And then secondly, it robs the animals of their spirits as well. It robs the animal and plant of their, of their spirit and their kinship with, human, with, uh, with humans. And so, uh, that hinders the development of a land ethic because you have to have a spiritual side to a land ethic. Land ethic cannot be built only on technology and science. And in fact, technology and science is part of the problem that has created this environmental situation that we find ourselves in. So we have to find a spiritual side or a spiritual dimension if we're going to forge a land ethic. And uh, so this religious question has been a hindrance that, that I've just described. It's been, a, it's been a barrier. And we have to, I think, protect our indigenous religions, uh, respect them, and perhaps learn something from them if we're going to develop a land ethic. The third uh, powerful force here at work is this legacy and mindset of colonialism. Colonialism um, is a 500 year, that 500 year history from 1492 to sometime after uh, World War II and the formation of the UN. A 500 year period when the nations of Europe uh, competed with each other to colonize as much of the rest of the world as possible. So we had a 500 year span where uh, all of Africa was colonized, the entire Western Hemisphere was colonized, subcontinent of India, most of Asia, Australia, the circumpolar world, the Pacific uh, Rim and all of the islands, uh, colonies. And uh, uh, the process of colonization um, uh, was pretty tough on the indigenous peoples because it invar invariably meant the uh, appropriation of their land, uh, in, uh, invasion, subjugation, the, and, but it was invariably accompanied by the destruction of their indigenous habitats as well. Uh, Christopher Sales in uh, uh, The Conquest of Paradise, you know, documented the massive environmental uh, changes brought about by the colonization of this hemisphere uh, over a few hundred year period. And so the problem with a legacy and a mindset of colonialism is that it looks at the land only as a resource to be, or, or looks at the land and the animals and plants only as a, in economic terms. The very purpose of a colony is to extract these resources in a one-way transfer to enrich the, the uh, colonists or the European elites at home. That's the purpose of a colony. And, uh, and uh, if we continue to uh, uh, look at the land through the eyes of a colonist, um, um, that's going to impede, it seems to me, the development of a land ethic. Um, and I would respectfully submit that no land ethic should ever be based on colonialism. 
because it's too, it's an oppressive uh, institution. It's too hard on the land and the animals and plants. But yet uh, we're, we are, and I think this is why Leopold was saying we, we kind of have to decolonize the way that we uh, look at the land here and not uh, view it, uh, look at the land through the eyes of a conqueror either. He eschewed that as a, uh, a land ethic in 1948 and quite rightly so. Um, <clears throat> finally, we have uh, the problem of leadership. This is the fourth factor that comes to my mind as a barrier to um, uh, developing a, an American land ethic. Who should lead in the development of a land ethic? Who is going to lead us to, to that, uh, that ethic? Um, the largest landowner in the United States is the federal government. They have land managing agencies that say they're the stewards of uh, the public lands. So you would reasonably expect the, the land managing agencies as the biggest landowner in the country, they're charged by law to have a higher standard of knowledge about this land to be a leader in crafting an American land ethic. But uh, there, as we know, you know, there's some very some serious structural weaknesses in these agencies and conflicts of interest, you know, that that hamper uh, and uh, probably opt them out, you know, as far as um, being actual leaders and leading us to a true land ethic. Um, and there's loopholes uh, in, in the legal system, in the Supreme Court, in the Ling decision that. Uh, uh, says there's no uh, First Amendment protection for Native American sacred sites uh, on federal lands that sort of uh, allows the Forest Service to run roughshod over these uh, surviving Native holy places. And so I think that in uh, being a destroyer of these uh, holy grounds, you know, uh, would forfeit any moral authority, it seems to me, to lead our nation as a... Um, into uh, uh, a bit, uh, forging a land ethic. So finally, uh, uh, these are all serious problems. You know, I think our Indian tribes are probably the, uh, in, in total, are probably the second largest landowner, uh, owning uh, 60 million acres in the lower, lower 48 and 50 million acres up in Alaska. But uh, the problem with, with the tribes uh, being a leader is that uh, the tribal interests have, are, are largely subordinated in our modern society. Marginalized, the tribal interests are usually marginalized as unimportant. Uh, and then I still think that in some quarters we have these uh, uh, attitudes of dis discriminatory treatment, you know, that uh, as far as the uh, native way of life is concerned. Uh, so we have this problem of leadership, uh, assuming that uh, we want to have a land ethic. Um, uh, who's going to lead us to that, uh, that new ethic? Who shall lead? So that, uh, that is, a, uh, it seems to me, a, a problem, you know. But I think that we have a changing society. I think that we no longer look at ourselves as settlers. I think that there's millions of Americans that uh, uh, are moving beyond that, that are, that are wanting to uh, come to terms with the natural world, you know, and, and adapt to, uh, to this, this land more like the native people and, and, and millions more are beginning to appreciate uh, the contributions of Native America and want to see them survive rather than to be stamped out, you know, and so, um, I have to be uh, hopeful, you know, that we can come to this land ethic because I, I, I think our nation sorely needs it. I think we're at a history in a post-colonial world where uh, the rest, uh, the, this UN declaration is the order, of the new order of the day and it, the provisions in there for protecting indigenous habitat and the traditional lands owned and used and occupied by uh, native people uh, 
if they are implemented, uh, could work a sea change in the way that the, our nation and the world looks at indigenous peoples and their indigenous habitats. And that uh, in turn, you know, I think, you know, at least in our nation, might, might help uh, bring to the forefront a little bit more uh, some of our indigenous uh, values and ideals that uh, I think are essential ingredients uh, toward a land ethic. So uh, I'd just like to close at this time, you know, uh, with, with some thoughts about uh, heading toward, uh, toward a, a land ethic that incorporates Native American wisdom traditions from our uh, tribal cosmologies, you know, that have uh, arisen from the soil here long ago. <clears throat> um, We have to remind ourselves that the native cultures have, are the ones that have sprung from this land and that they did derive from a hunting, fishing, and gathering existence. And that existence uh, uh, was a way of life that produced an astounding primal cosmology that revels in Mother Earth's remarkable ability to support life. And it proclaims Mother Earth as the foundation for human culture. That is human culture, ethics, morals, religion, art, politics, and economics derived from the cycles of nature, the behavior of animals, the growth of plants, and from our human interdependence with all living things that are endowed with a spirit of their own. And in the cosmology of Native American gatherers, and I have clients that I've walked these native plant communities with, and in-laws that, uh, that have ceremonies devoted to roots and berries in the, in the Columbia River Gorge, Plants hold an esteemed place of honor as the foundation for human and animal life in these cosmologies. And that the Native American perception of animals mirrors the hunting and hunting cultures around the world and exalts the animals and places them on a, a high level of reverence through ceremonies of all kinds, songs, dances, art forms. There's a spiritual reverence for animals. And, and this has produced a very elaborate worldview right under our very feet that explains how humans should comport themselves with the animals. So I would submit that historians and Indian scholars and world religion experts can put flesh on these general observations that I've made with the help of traditional native people, including our religious leaders and our hunter, fisher, and gatherers that, we, that still do that, and synthesize some land ethics for our nation, along with uh, ecologists, uh, biologists, ethnobotanists, and uh, cultural anthropologists that can take this wisdom that has been gleaned, you know, over the millennia and add their own expertise and knowledge and together as a nation, perhaps we can forge a truly American land ethic. So in conclusion, I would just say that our land can speak to those who listen to it. And I want to close with some native voices from the land, and I'll begin with my own tribe, Eagle Chief, in 1907, and he said this, in the beginning of all things, wisdom and knowledge were with the animals. For Didawa, the one above, did not speak directly to the people. He spoke to people through his works, the stars, the sun and moon, the beasts and the plants. For all things tell of Didawa. When people sought to know how they should live, they went into solitude and prayed until a vision 
that some animal brought wisdom to them. It was Tidawa who sent that message through the animal. He never spoke to people himself, but he gave his command to bird or beast, which came to some chosen person and taught him holy things. So it was in the beginning. Brave Buffalo, a Lakota in 1918 said this, all people have a liking for some special animal, tree, plant, or spot of earth. If they would pay attention to these preferences and seek what is best to make themselves worthy of that to which they are attracted, they might have dreams that would purify their lives. Pete Ketches, a Lakota in 1973, said this, all animals have power because the great spirit dwells in all of them. Even a tiny ant, a butterfly, a tree, a flower, a rock. Black Elk said this in 1932. One should pay attention to even the smallest crawling creature for these may have a valuable lesson to teach us. Even the smallest ant may wish to communicate to a man. And here closer to home among our Ho-Chunk people, the great and late Reuben Snake said this in 1993. When you look at all other parts of creation, all of the other living creatures, the Creator endowed them with gifts that are far better than ours. Compared to the strength of the grizzly, bear, the sharp-sightedness of the eagle, the fleetness of the deer, and the acute hearing of the otter, we're pitiful human beings. We don't have any of these special physical attributes that the Creator put into everything else. For that reason, we have to be compassionate with one another and help one another out to hold each other up. These are some of the voices uh, from the land here in native North America. And let me just say that uh, by way of closing that America has a primal legacy. Despite our secular mindset, our nation is well endowed with indigenous wisdom traditions that transcend modernity. Everyone is an heir to hunt the hunters and fishers and gatherers legacy. That legacy left indelible tracks in each person. Our ancestors became fully human in the natural world. That cosmology is alive and well. It lies on the land beneath our own feet. Let us arise then and recapture the best in that worldview and fashion a land ethic for the 21st century. Thank you. Yes, please. If anyone has a question, I'm happy, as long as it's easy. <laughs> um, I'd love to hear it. Yes, ma'am? So, uh, you said by uh, protecting the, the sacred side of the Indian, we can build this bridge of the respect and, um, and then knowledge, more knowledge. The comment was that uh, by protecting uh, uh, Native American holy places in the United States, we can gain a better knowledge of the 
land on which we live as far as the land ethic. I think you're right, you know, and, and it is a challenge because uh, um, American law and social policy just simply doesn't acknowledge or have any legal protection for holy ground here in the United States, you know, and I think that uh, all, uh, most of Americans uh, are religious people, you know, but our religious places are all located in the Middle East. And uh, uh, it is the responsibility of each nation to protect the holy places within their borders. And they do that in Israel, you know, for example. Um, and I think it's incumbent upon our own nation to do the same thing, to realize that right here in America, we have probably more holy places that are equally profound than that in the, as that rivals that in the Middle East. And our laws and social policies need to be accountable to that reality. And in so doing, uh, would serve to open our eyes to the sacred quality of this land that we are all uh, live together on, you know, as 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 uh, diverse peoples join together on 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 the uh, same land, you know. Well, I see I've um, answered all of the questions for a land ethic. <laughs> so, any other uh, comments or? Uh, Sir, it would seem to me that you need one more challenge in your personal uh, life, and that would be to write the first approximation to an American land ethic. You've got a great title for your lecture tonight, and I think you have to do this and get it out and let people then pick at it so you can improve that over time. I know there could be lots of discussion that would go on forever talking about the need for it, and I have no doubts about that. But what we need is someone like yourself who has the knowledge and the passion to put this on paper so that people can study it and make further suggestions about the development. Thank you, sir. The, the comment was um, uh, that the, our first step is for someone such as myself to uh, put this in writing and circulate it for a discourse. I hope my editor heard that, my publisher, Mr. Sam Shenta. Um, and, and in fact, we have been talking about a, uh, a book that would uh, be a comp compilation of um, of uh, articles, you know, that would uh, uh, talk to, a, uh, speak to the need for a land ethic. I want to know what the uh, Chicanos, for example, think about these matters. I want to know what the uh, uh, American rancher thinks. Those families uh, out in the West that have been living on the land for several generations are really adapting out there. Uh, certain certain families, you know, and, and uh, we have all of these segments of our society, you know, and, and uh, this wealth of uh, ecology expertise, and, and uh, I think that together, you know, we could forge a, a very meaningful, truly unique and workable uh, ethic that would provide some cohesion, you know, for uh, our maturing society and, and uh, so we, we had been thinking about a volume that would um, uh, do something like that. Yes, ma'am? Um, I'd like to um, bring up the fact that that whole country we are, we do live in that, uh, that realm where we do have a uh, relationship with and we have the same relationship with um, nature. However, I believe that with that we may have that relates to some drumming that we're having here, but 
that is something I don't think that, you know, that probably society is really not ready to believe. Probably not until they learn more about the planning the uh, comment was the uh, from the Ho-Chunk people that are here um, and I agree with you uh, and I would just want to say this for this community uh, uh, La Crosse I think that you are very blessed to have a very profound tribe of Indians such as the Ho-Chunk people here as a part of this community uh, they are a very, very spiritual people, and I've I had the uh, privilege of uh, working with Mr. Douglas Long on the uh, peyote religion and working with uh, Reuben Snake, um, a man who was an orator, a uh, spiritual leader for his people, and an ambassador, and uh, I've come to this conclusion. If you can't be a whole chunk Indian, the next best thing is to be their attorney. So. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. God bless.